In this episode, we discuss whether it is better to focus on improving the GDP or solving the unemployment crisis in a country. We also talk about how September rains came as a boon to Indian farmers and have alleviated concerns about food inflation. But first, we talk about a cat and mouse game that transpired at the Delhi State Athletics Championship. Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav, and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. In the recently concluded Delhi State Athletics Championship, athletes taking part didn't just sprint against their competitors, but also ran to escape the clutches of the anti-doping authorities. In fact, many of them didn't even show up, knowing that the officials would be there. Indian Express's Andrew Amson was there when this happened, and he told us more about it. So it was the final day of the Delhi State Athletics Championship. and um, anti doping officials from nada which is the national anti doping agency were present usually they skip these uh, state level meets although they are supposed to be there but we've seen this trend uh, since the last few years that they usually skip this state level meets but this time around they were there and uh, on the final day in athletics you have heats and then people with good timings are selected for the finals So in track events you have eight slots. So for a lot of events there were barely any participants. There were three or four. And for the hundred meter men's finals, which is probably one of the best, I mean most sought after events, and you always have participants. Only one boy turned up. Only one person turned up for the hundred meters finals, and he ran the race. So it was just. Uh, I mean, the scenes were surreal because when he was running, and people around were actually cheering him. I don't know if, if they were actually making fun or they really meant it, but it was a scene you had to be there. There were some people who were like saying "gajab" or like as if some record has been broken. But although, yeah, it is funny and also sad at the same time, Sashan. Right, and Andrew, you mentioned that doping officials have not been showing up at state events. Was there a reason that they showed up this time? Yeah, so I have covered a lot of these state meets, and um, usually what happens it's back and forth. You ask Delhi state officials why are they not present? They'd say we have written them a letter informing that the event is happening from so and so date, and not officials didn't turn up. So this would be the case. But this time around, uh, there was this uh, video of uh, taken by a coach in one of the boys' washrooms, and you know the sinks were full of syringes, and uh, syringes were lying everywhere. So that. video kind of went really viral and i was told by a lot of coaches that the particular video reached the higher ups especially uh, officials in the ministry and there has been a special push as far as i understand in terms of testing because even in national level events i haven't seen this many dope officers i think i spotted at least 8 to 10 uh, dope officers for a state level meet which actually should be the norm but this wasn't the case earlier so this is a very major development in terms of cleaning the sport or recurbing uh, doping in athletics and you said that in the men's 100 meter final there was only one athlete present uh, this guy named lalit kumar what was his reaction to the whole thing oh this was weird like i spoke to lalit after the event got over even he didn't know how to react because so all this while he was uh, taking part in the under 20 category so this was his first senior category so his initiation to senior uh, state athletics wasn't ideal so he told me that he was really looking forward to participate with you know the best state athletes there were and in those seven who didn't come there were a lot of previous state champions and a lot of them with very good timings per se but they never turned up so as a professional athlete you would always want to push yourself especially in uh, track events in sprints you always need a fellow athlete uh, to push you so he was more than anything he was very disappointed to see senior as he looked up to and he was uh, looking forward to uh, compete with not turning up just because uh, dope officials were present and you've also written that in one instance the doping officials had to physically chase an athlete right Yeah, this was so interesting. There's this very senior coach who was officiating there. So he said there was this girl who finished the 2000 meter steeple chase for juniors. Uh, usually, the steeple chase is 3000 meters. For juniors, uh, the distance is reduced. So usually, athletes are exhausted. They're literally like they just can't. I mean, steeple chase is a grueling event. 
So after the event, usually athletes just go flat. They probably just lie down. In this case, she kept on going. Good athlete, probably. So she kept on going even after crossing the finishing line. And the NADA officials usually stand near the finish line, so where they can just see the list and take the medalists for test. So she spotted them. So she didn't stop. She continued her lap and tried to just. go to the parking lot and uh, it was her misfortune probably someone fitter than her in the <laughs> official team chased her down also i would like to add this is probably not the first time this is happening this is a very um, common thing actually and in fact i like to recall a story 2019 when i had gone to cover the javelin nationals in sonipat so there even a funnier incident happened so one of the athletes sent a proxy to the doping test i mean the only thing similar to them was their hairstyle so i don't know how did he think he would pull it off so he actually sent someone else for the dope test and when they asked for the documents and all something happened and the next thing you see you see the person and the original athlete bolting out like the running of the track and nada officials are chasing them state um, the meet officials are chasing them and you know it's just so funny i just saw people running so i instinctively start following them so i was running with them and then i saw these two guys cross the highway so the sai center in sonipat is right on the highway so they cross the highway and try to cross the highway to i mean endless fields so they just disappear into the fields and one of the officials was like वो देखो खेत पे गायब हो आई एक्चुअली यूज दैट कोड सो आई आई से दिस नेवर अ डल डे इन एथलेटिक्स सो या एंड एंड्रू दीस स्टोरीज ऑफ कोर्स आर फनी बट कुड यू जस्ट टेल अ लिसनर्स अबाउट द प्रेवलेंस ऑफ परफॉर्मेंस एनहांसिंग ड्रग्स एट द स्टेट लेवल एंड जस्ट द काइंड ऑफ कंसर्न्स देयर इज so just today i got a call from a junior asian level medalist a very promising athlete and whose performance is off late been down he practices at the same jawaharlal nehru stadium and he just called me out of the blue and said andrew bhaiya thank you for doing the story because athletes like me suffer because of these people who dope and the performance you just for, to even get a national level medal you need at least 3 to 4 years to build up as a junior athlete and these kids just come in take these shortcuts and they rob of uh, resources chances and opportunities which genuine athletes deserve and all they want is to get into these government schemes where you get money or go to the nationals eventually there also somehow just barely get a medal and get a job in the railways and all those things but ultimately genuine athletes suffer and genuine athletes give up i mean to a certain level they can try and compete with them but then this is probably starting from 50 meters behind the finish line when you have an athlete who's doped and ready okay so what you're saying is that these athletes who are doping are not doing it to advance their future careers but just so that they can avail the benefit of government schemes Absolutely. So a lot of these kids who generally take these shortcuts aren't looking for a long-term career. Their goal is to get these short-term benefits like money from various schemes or eventually some kind of a government job or in some sector where these certificates actually help. So I was wondering why would athletes I mean push or risk taking drugs even in I mean probably a state level meet but i went through some government schemes today even for a delhi state a champion I and mean, for a delhi state medalist you are eligible for 16 lakh rupees scholarship for a year 16 lakh rupees so that is a huge amount of money for a 20 year old or a 19 year old so the incentives of course i am not justifying it but absolutely these incentives and these uh, short term benefits are definitely one of the reasons people tend to dope and andrew the drugs that these guys are taking are they readily available in the market yeah so these drugs are available at any chemist so there's this category of drugs called epo which is actually used for anemia so it increases the oxygen level in your blood and increases the hemoglobin so this epo syringes are very commonly seen in such venues so i spoke to a, a doctor medical expert who on doping especially so the funny part is a lot of these athletes who are doping don't even know how it works so for the epo to actually work in your body you have to take it a few days in advance because hemoglobin just doesn't shoot up in a day so i i wonder what they are actually doing it but it actually is helping but the intention is absolutely malicious and um, sad and next we discuss whether it is better to focus on improving the gdp or solving the unemployment crisis in a country for some time now in an effort to become the world's biggest economy india has been trying to increase its overall gdp the total market value of all its finished goods and services 
And even though it has struggled to do that, especially due to the pandemic and the Russia-Ukraine crisis, the idea has been that focusing on this metric will enable the country to become more prosperous and would also help alleviate the unemployment problem. But it turns out that this might not be the case. A new report called The State of Working India by the Azim Premji University looked at the relationship between GDP and employment starting from the early 80s. And it highlights that focusing on GDP hasn't been particularly effective in generating substantial job opportunities. Indian Express's Udit Mishra recently wrote about this in his column and he now joins us to talk about it. Udit, firstly, what is the reason that GDP always dominates the narrative when it comes to improving the health of the economy? Why is it that policy makers focus so much on it? Well, the first thing to note is that GDP is one of the most basic fundamental measures of an economy's well-being. It's the size of the economy and it is a starting point for any analysis. And if you think about it from a developing country perspective, it is thought that there can be no development, there can be no prosperity, no other metric will be solved until and unless we have a certain amount of economic growth. So that is why GDP is so central to all debate and discussion in a country like India, because it is presumed that it's a necessary condition for any kind of uh, improvement such as employment. And to a great extent, that is true also. It is a necessary condition that one must have for achieving goals, say, on employment. Right, because the idea is that more GDP will lead to more employment, that more growth would create more jobs. Yes, the idea is that a higher GDP year-on-year growth would necessarily involve more employment, more productivity, advances in technology, so all-round improvement. But that's an argument that uh, sort of stays on paper. Real-life application of that has to be seen country by country and in different countries' economic experience or growth experience could throw up a different picture. Right, so let's talk about India. India has been consistently trying to increase its GDP. But tell us, in this pursuit, have we managed to increase jobs as well? Well, the Indian experience is actually less salutary in this regard. We also presume that GDP growth is the primary thing that we should target and that everything else will follow, such as poverty reduction or employment growth. But as uh, a recent report from Azim Premji University has shown, and this is something that has been said in the past also, but has shown that for every improvement, 1% increase in GDP, the degree of employment that it created was far less than 1%. And what is worse is that as time has gone by, this elasticity of employment, as it were, like the response of higher growth on employment has actually become worse. So if we look at data from 1983 onwards, and this is all official data, we find that between 1983 and 2017, that is just before the pandemic, we find that uh, the employment elasticity kept falling, which is to say that even though GDP was high, we could not create as much of a good well-paying jobs in, say, non-agricultural sectors. So it's been a fairly modest record that India has on this count. And how long does the report say we've had this problem? So actually, it has been worsening since 1983. The data that Azim Premji University looks at since 1983. So we're looking at roughly a period of uh, 35, 40 years. And it has found that between 1983 to 2017, the employment elasticity kept falling. So we kept getting worse in our ability to create more jobs as we grew faster. So it's been a quite a negative trend in that sense. There has been a brief period in the last few years where employment elasticity has improved, but there are other reasons why that's a very misleading metric as things stand. And could you break this down for our listeners? Because it seems counterintuitive, right? How can GDP increase and not employment? Don't we need people to make those goods and services? 
So the trick lies in understanding that GDP is the market value of all goods and services. Now, the GDP can increase because maybe two people sit down and make a very good program which is valued at a very high price in the market. And uh, there can be another instance where a lot of people come together in a factory or what or a firm and they may create a product which is not valued as much. So there can be an instance where very few people can create a lot of GDP, a lot of market value. And then there can be many other instances where a lot of people can come together and may not create as much GDP. So it has been happening in India's case that, you know, small sections of our population, they may be in big companies in terms of size or smaller companies, but, you know, smaller populations have been creating more value in terms of GDP, whereas large number of people have remained unemployed or have stayed employed in pursuits or in work, which has not created as much a value. So these two things are not totally impossible. It's quite possible for this to happen. So I think it is possible to have lots of prosperity and good GDP, but it is also possible that you may get stuck in a growth model where you have a lot of GDP to show, but you may not have enough jobs. And the latter is the case that India is going through or has been going through for a few decades now. Right. And this is the reason why the government has been giving a push to the industrial sector, because manufacturing, for example, can employ a lot of people. But Udit, this report also points out that the jobs generated by an increasing GDP are not distributed equally in the economy. Could you just elaborate on this point a bit? Yes. So in the sense that, you know, you have to understand that GDP can increase because you are a small team of programmers sitting in a tech city, creating new programs, earning a lot of uh, market value. But GDP could also come from, say, very labor intensive work like creating, say, jute products or textile products or could be, you know, leather products. And that value may not be as much. Now, we could be stuck or as it seems like we could be in a scenario where in India, a lot of growth is happening in such a manner that it is very capital intensive, that all of it happens with machines and not with as many human beings. Now, so you can have a scenario where a lot of people might be outside the workforce or might be getting discouraged by being part of the labor force and not getting jobs while the GDP continues increasing because many other firms are doing very high value work. And so Udit, what would you say is the upshot here? Is the idea that a country like India should be focusing more on generating employment than GDP? Yes. So I think one issue that has been highlighted again repeatedly by many academics and thinkers is that, you know, too much of a focus on just one variable and total neglect of the other could create a very unequal society, a very unequal country. You could be growing very fast, but maybe creating massive pockets of uh, inequality and discontent. So at long length, people and policymakers in particular will have to focus on ensuring that a considerable portion of India's youth in particular gets jobs. Otherwise, they will get disheartened very quickly. And we're seeing that youth unemployment rates are pretty high. The problem there is that Indian policymakers have been trying different things. And somehow the growth model doesn't seem to be responding to create more jobs. And there are no easy solutions here because, you know, on the one hand, there is the old notion that maybe we should boost our industrial production, but that hasn't taken off. And there are headwinds of the kind that, you know, globally, the mood has turned protectionist. Countries are not trading as much, not exporting and importing as much. So there are question marks on whether, you know, that kind of a old school industrialization will actually happen in India or not. And if that doesn't happen, then where are the solutions? You know, services sector jobs are not enough in numbers to sort of say really absorb the youth that we have and satisfy their employment needs. So it's a bit of a a tough situation that we are facing. We must continue to grow fast. There is no argument that, you know, we could perhaps grow slower and and create more jobs. That's not going to happen. But we have to focus increasingly that the quality or the method of our growth is such that more and more people become stakeholders. They become part of that growth process. Otherwise, it can create a significant amount of unrest and that will create a drag of its own on the sustainability of economic growth.
And next we talk about how the rainfall this month has come as a huge relief to Indian farmers, especially after the extended dry spell of August. In fact, as many of you would recall, last month was the driest August since 1901, ever since the Med Department began maintaining records. And this was devastating for farmers because July and August are months when we typically expect to receive the highest levels of rainfall. The maximum rainfall happens during this time. That's Harish Damodaran, Indian Express's rural affairs editor. The farmers typically would say so around say June, okay? June and maybe first half of July. And after that, after you sow, the plants need water, okay? Especially during the vegetative uh, state growth. When they're developing roots, leaves, stem and all these things, they need a lot of water and which is supplied by the rains during this time. So in large parts of India, farmers would have sown in July. Mainly one reason is because you had a dry first half of June and it started raining around the last week of June. So a lot of uh, sowing happened in July. So after farmers have sown, you had this very long dry spell, entire, the whole of August. You can say almost from the last week of uh, July to something like, uh, you know, the entire August. He says the overall rainfall deficit in the country was 36.2%. And so as a result, farmers really struggled to keep their crops alive. And those who succeeded had to depend on dams managed by the irrigation department or tap into the underground water reserves. And normally, July and August, you don't use uh, water from your underground reserves and from the dams, etc. You know? So normally, the irrigation the departments hardly release any dam water. And this is a time when actually you try and build more and more reserves. You know? He says this is the period where reservoirs are supposed to be replenished, to be used later for the winter crops. But this time, farmers ended up using them for the summer crops instead. Though thankfully, September came as a pleasant surprise. Hari says that so far, we have seen almost 17% of surplus rain. As one farmer put it, you know, he called it actually an Amrit Sanjeevani. And you know that Sanjeevani is basically that, you know, Lord Lakshman was revived through the Sanjeevani, right? So you can say that, I mean, so these rains have been a real, some kind of a manna from heaven. And I would say that uh, a lot of your Kharif crop may have been saved because of these life-saving showers. Now, back in August, there were concerns that the dry spell would lead to a significant price rise, especially among the summer crops. But now, due to the recent rains, many of those fears have been alleviated. So, I would say that vegetables is fine, okay? I'll say oil seeds is fine. Because soybean and groundnut, uh, etc., they really benefited from these rains. And plus, I think India has been importing a lot of uh, edible oil. So there's been definitely a lot of softening of those prices, you know. So September has been uh, unusually uh, lucky. But this doesn't mean that there are no challenges ahead. He says both rice and pulses will see a shortage of production this time. So I would say that... uh, Going forward, the food inflation fears will still remain, mainly because we have depleted quite a bit of our uh, reservoir water levels. And also probably even the groundwater situation may not be all that good, you know, to support the rabi crop. And as you know, that rabi crop is mostly uh, irrigated, you know. We sometimes do get, you know, a bit of winter rains. They're very helpful, actually, you know. But we don't know whether those winter rains will happen because of uh, El Nino. So I would say that we are definitely not uh, out of the woods at all in food inflation. And the September showers have definitely been, I mean, it's almost like, a, you know, soothing. It's been like a, a balm, you know, but the injury is still there, you know, and the injury will take some time to recover. You were listening to Three Things by The Indian Express. Today's show was written and produced by me, Shashank Bhargav, and was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can tweet us at Express Podcasts and write to us at podcast at IndianExpress.com.